Hello Nietzsche and 101. I'm going to try to keep this um, video to just one video, a 10 minute segment. I've tried twice before doing that unsuccessfully. So assume that I spend about a couple minutes complimenting you on your um, intelligence and your demeanor and your responses. Um, because I did that in my previous attempts of making a video. I want to thank you for clarifying the soup kitchen analogy. Uh, I agree with you that the soup kitchen analogy um, works just fine if you assume that the death penalty is something that is um, desirable in society. Um, <clears throat> as far as the claim that we demonstrate uh, the value of life by employing the death penalty. I think that we're going to have to agree to disagree on that one. I don't. I think we're at a bit of an impasse there. Uh, I, I realize that you quoted John Stuart Mill, and as loath as I am to uh, disagree with a genius like John Stuart Mill, I'm the second point. I have to disagree. I still think it's paradoxical to say the least, if not contra outright contradictory, to say that we value life by having policies whereby under certain circumstances um, we can take life. Um, about the intrinsic contingent value of life, you admit that your position um, is that human life is contingent and uh, I'm glad you did admit to that because it seems to me that was an Im a clear implication of your position. Uh, you say that it's not unreasonable to make this contingency uh, dependent on individuals not murdering other people and you would only apply that contingency to that condition. Um, I understand that if we lived in a world where Nietzschean 101 was the benevolent dictator then perhaps uh, we would have a just application of the death penalty um, to the extent that the death penalty, the application of it could be just. But we, but in the real world we still have that slippage problem that I am uh, talk about, um, that I've been talking about in over the course of at least two videos. Um, that is, that's legislators, legislatures around the world and across the, the states in the United States try to apply the death penalty to more crimes than just heinous murder. Um, so we have a real world problem there that, um, um, that seems to escape the parameters of theoretical discussions about the death penalty. You asked me a very good question, how can intrinsic value be established? Um, and I will readily admit to you that it's very difficult uh, to um, find a kind of um, a, an, epistemolo uh, an epistemologically incontrovertible establishment for uh, intrinsic value. But well, I guess well, what I would say is that um, my position is that it need not be established epistemologically. Um, that there might be good pragmatic reasons for societies to as much as, as is practicable to heuristically assume that human life is intrinsically valuable. After all, to do so, it seems to me, would safeguard individuals from a whole range of abuses, particularly uh, ones uh, that protect people from injury to life in limb. So, what I'm suggesting then is that it's important as a working assumption for societies as much as they possibly can to assume that life has intrinsically 
that the life has intrinsic value um, in order to protect the citizenry from abuse, from official abuse um, by their governments. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned abortion. Uh, you say correctly that I've been using the term human life and if I've been using the term human life um, a fetus qualifies as um, human life as does a fertilized egg uh, and if human life has intrinsic value doesn't the a fetus the fertilized egg have intrinsic value the only thing I could say is that um, um, I've been using human life in, in, in a way in which I assume that um, that the human life of persons has intrinsic value. Uh, the question about abortion, it seems to me, has a lot to do with uh, at what point does a fetus become a human person? I. I think it's pretty self-evident that a fertilized egg, uh, although it's human life, is not a human person. I mean, after all, if human life per se uh, were intrinsically valuable, we wouldn't surgically remove tumors from bodies, since tumors are human life, chromosomally. Uh, but uh, clearly they're not persons. Um, so, when I say human life, I, I mean the human life of persons. You mentioned uh, uh, how about Hitler and Bonhoeffer, if they both have intrinsic value, their lives both have intrinsic value, you say, then there should be no uh, significant difference in how we esteem uh, Hitler and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you argue. I would say in response to that, that intrinsic value is a minimal threshold of value. And that's consonant with me considering uh, intrinsic value as a heuristic assumption, as a working assumption. But there's also other ways that we value human beings. There's acquired value or acquired disvalue that one accrues over a lifetime. And that depends on a variety of factors, most notably on how one behaves and comports oneself in the world. So the up upshot of my position would be that Hitler's life, like Bonhoeffer's life, has the same intrinsic value, but not the same acquired value. So yes, um, um, I would I value Bonhoeffer much more than I do Adolf Hitler, uh, although I would say that Adolf Hitler's life has intrinsic value. It's a minimal kind of threshold, a minimal kind of value. Um, but it, uh, if you want me to say something very controversial along these lines, if um, Hitler had been captured and tried, I would have been opposed to the application of the death penalty against him because that would have violated the intrinsic value of Hitler's life. So that's, um, that's my response. I hope to hear from you again. Thank you, thank you again for your, your good responses.